So we are very happy to have Jafim that not only is one of the organizers giving us a lot of uh, strength to, to this new project that is we are here together in this project with Rodrigo that is now in, in Sweden and also with Umberto that is from Aracaju. And, but it actually is uh, every one course because of course we cannot have this course without you, the students. So we're very happy that you're there and we hope that this is, uh, is a bridge for different area to come together and to be able to use the, uh, the tools of the dynamic system. So very happy to have Jacqueline that is fantastic uh, professor in our university. So please Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefanella. So welcome everyone. Like, uh, like Stefanella would like to thank the participation of the students. So please feel free to ask questions. If you are Brazilian and you are too shy to ask the question in English, you can ask the question in Portuguese. There is no problem. Okay. So I will try to, 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 to do the first lecture slow and uh, more ludic. I don't know if this word exists in English, but more, more, more uh, joyful, let's say like this. But, uh, and then we increase a bit the rhythm of the, of the course. So this is, my idea is, is to give just a, fir a first contact with this very nice field where I, I'm working on, the God theory. Um, let me start by giving a, panorama of what I, I plan to do in these four lectures. So I, I want to start with a, a, a very short review of measure theory. So for the students that are undergrad students, they can have a time to adapt. And maybe if you don't know much measure theory, if you didn't see, we can have an idea and can still enjoy the course. And now our, our main um, the main concept is the invariant measures concept. So we do it uh, today. And if we have time, we will, we will see the Poincaré recurrence theorem, which is a very nice and uh, very beautiful application. So it's very nice. Well, and the second lecture, I, I hope to give a few examples of uh, measure preserving dynamical systems. Well, dynamical systems that uh, have an invariant measure. And the lecture three, we devote to ergodicity. And uh, we finish with the birkhoff sergod theory. That's the, I put the plane very, very general because we plan and we always, we don't go, don't, you are not able to deliver the plane. I'm sure that I'm not able to, to finish what I plan for today. So Stefanella, if my time is out, please just let me know or I stop and then we continue the next lecture. So before we start, I want to give you some references. This is a, it's a well-established course. So we have very nice references. You can find the very good books. Uh, we have two versions of a nice book that is uh, from two Brazilians, Crerley uh, uh, Oliveira and Marcelo Viana. They have the book in the English version and in the Portuguese version. And this is somewhat affordable for, uh, for Brazilians. It's a good price, the book. So I... I'm doing an advertisement for this book. It's quite nice. And uh, so for, a, but this is a big book. So this is for a year of a course, not just a semester, a year of a course. Basically the basic that you need for a good theory is on the, this book. So it's a good reference. There are the most more classic books. For instance, I can suggest the Peter Walter's book, An Introduction to Ergodic Theory. That actually is the book that I studied because when I did Ergodic Theory, this one was not available, <laughs> but uh, it's a nice book. And I also like the Portuguese book of uh, Manier, Theory Ergodica. This, I don't think it's available anymore. I don't think that they produce, but if you look on some uh, old book stores, you can find. And there are some notes that you can find uh, online that's more easy to, to find. I also put the links for it. And when I, I, I give the slides for you, you can search for it. So there are the lecture notes from Corina Uchigrai, which have many examples. It's very nice. And one a bit more advanced 
it's from Sarig, but with a nice point of view. I, uh, he writes more like a literature, it's, it's nice. And in Portuguese, uh, we have this, it's a pre-version of this book that I suggested. It's a book from a colloquio, Brazilian colloquio of uh, mathematics, and it's available online also. So you have plenty of references, and I think, I think you can even have a, a start point from these lecture notes from Uchigrai. Okay. So then let's start with some motivation. Uh, why we, we like to study God theory, where we can apply, what are the reasons, where it was born from. So let's start motivating a bit. So let's start, well, God theory, it's a part of the dynamical systems field. So what's a dynamical system? Well, it's a system that evolves in time according with a determinist law. It means the present determines the future. So in general, you can describe a dynamical system. There are many different uh, definitions of a dynamical system, but in general, you can describe it by having a space that determines the possible states and the law that evolves this state. So uh, an evolution or a motion law. You can, we will consider two, two kinds of uh, dynamical systems. Uh, the discrete time dynamical systems, which is just a map. You consider a map defined on a set on, uh, on itself. So it's important that it goes on itself because what we want to do is to uh, consider a state. A state is simply, it's simply a point on, the, on your set M and you apply the law and the state moves. So the next point is F of X. So what you have is that after a unit of time, you have the new, um, sorry, it's appears something on front of my, okay. So it appears uh, a new state after a unit of time. So FX is simply the new uh, state of X after a unit of time. So it's discrete because you consider units of time. If you consider, continuous time, my, okay. If you, continuous, if you consider continuous time dynamical systems, you can consider flows. So just to recall a flow, it's a family of maps that satisfy two conditions. The first one, the zero map, it's a di identity. And when you compose the FT with uh, FS, that is equal to FT plus S. It's a, it's a group uh, action, no? So you can think, if you study the differentiation, differential equations, you can think of flow as the solution of some defined equation. We are not, if, if you don't know anything about flow, you can be calm because we are not going to focus on flows. I'm going to give some ideas where the flows appear and how could we extend some results for it. But the, 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 the goal will be to focus on discrete time dynamical systems. So if I consider a dynamical system, it will be simply a map. What we have to think if what conditions we may include on the set and, and on the map F to start to have some results. Okay. So what we want to do in dynamical systems is to iterate things. Né? What's an iteration? You consider your dynamical system. Now for us, it's a map. And then you have a point, which is the initial state. This is the time zero. Let's think it, it as a time zero. And then Fx is just the state after a unit of time. And then if you apply F again, so you have your, recall that your map is acting on M on itself. So you have X and then you apply and then you have FX and then you apply F again with the note by F to X. So it's another point. And then you continue doing this. So F to X, it's the F composed with F two, two times and it's the state after two units of time. If you continue doing this any times, so F and X, it's gonna be 
FNX is going to be the state. So you define your state, initial state. And if you know who is FNX, you know the, the state and, and units of time after. So what you, you have? Well, what's, what's our dream as dynamics? Let's predict the future. It's enough to compute F and X because F and X is the future state of X. Well, we are in the middle of a pandemic. And then I think if we learn something, we learn that life is hard. So reality is not, uh, is not easy. And then in general, we cannot predict. You cannot predict the future. And uh, in general, there are many problems that can occur. First, maybe we don't have the map given explicitly. Even if you have the map given explicitly, you may not be able to compute or even estimate because you can try to start the estimate and there are, there are problems that appear because most of the systems have a sensibility to the initial conditions. So it, it can be big problems. So, okay, life is hard, but we all survive. Huh? We just have to stay a bit calm and develop other ideas. Okay, it's too hard to understand. It's too hard to predict the future. But the ergodic theory emerges like a solution. Okay, instead of studying all the points, all the, all the Fn, let's, let's establish a um, notation. So if you don't recall, a orbit of a point is the set of its iteration. So the orbit of a point would be x, fx, f2x, fnx, and so on. So the idea is to study all the odds of all the points. So the God theory says, well, we want to understand Fn. So let's understand the asymptotic behavior of these points, but not for all the points. Let's choose some points in the space that are enough for, the, for understand. How do you study these points? You introduce a measure, that's relevant to your, to your map. So you have a map, your dynamical systems, and then you are going to introduce a measure, not any measure, but a good measure that will give good information. If you choose good points according to this measure, it is take a, a, a set that is zero measure, these you throw away and just study the rest, the complement of a, a, a zero measure set, the full measure set. And these measures are going to be called the invariant measures and we are going to study later. Okay. So that's the, that's the main goal. We cannot study all the points, but you can study some and you can obtain some information via measures. So ergodicity, ergodicity ah, it's missing the D here, ergodicity. It's a nice word. Huh? And uh, it was introduced by Boltzmann, a physicist that, uh, well, big, big name now in physics. Uh, and means, means the following. It's ergon plus odos in Latin. So a work path, the path to work. So but Boltzmann, uh, he, he introduced this because he thought about the following ergodic hypothesis. I'm not going to explain to Matt, I just want to give a historic idea. So he thought that for some observables, some fun functions with values in R, the time average, average in time, it was the same as average in the space. So think of the flow. You have the, the, the variable that is time and the variable that is space. So for, for uh, Boltzmann, most of the Hamiltonian flows, some subject that we studied in this school last semester, they were ergodic. He expects that they were ergodic in the sense that the time average were equal to the space average. Again, life is not easy and it was not true. Komogorov proved that actually most of the Hamiltonian flows are not ergodic. But this leads to very good things because he developed together with Arnold and Moser the very well-known KAM theory. 
And more, more than this, this also lead to the God theory because Poincaré start to, start to study the God hypothesis of, uh, of Boltzmann. And he trying to understand why he wants the time average to be equal to the space average and wh what he can get through it. So he's, he realized that the idea of, of getting information for the dynamical systems is to change the point of view. So instead of looking with um, uh, determinate point of view, let's put a probabilist point of view. So let's not include all the points, but let's include the measure and start to understand the points via this measure. And that was the great idea of, uh, of point career that led to the, the, the birth of ergodic theory. I find it's very beautiful. Well, okay. So I, I have to, to say that ergodic theory, it's a field uh, very supported in two, two other fields, which is analysis and probabilities measure theory, you can think. So if you start to study, you see very many features of these other fields. And you see that we use this a lot to, to, to get the results. But it has several applications in, in, in many fields. And at least for me, the most surprisingly, it's an application in combinatorial number theory. So let me just to finish this motivation, let me just give you some, uh, some um, ideas of, uh, of the kind of application that we have nowadays in combinatorial number theory. So in 75, Zemered proved that uh, uh, integer subsets with higher positive density, I'm not defining positive density, contain finite, finite, the word here is finite, contain finite arithmetic progressions of arbitrary large length. Okay, this was a big result in combinatorial number theory. This was a conjecture since 36 by Erdos and Turan and Zemered proving 75. But then in 77, Furstenberg realized that, uh, well, this argument that Zemered did, it was actually very similar to the multiple recurrence that, that is an argument that we have in God theory. And then he redid the proof of Zemered using this argument and building a completely new proof using God theory. Of course, this was very nice and well received in the, in the field because Furstenberg did a very profound connection between two big fields that are uh, the, the, uh, that are very far, let's say that they are far away. Well, even like this, uh, not everyone was happy and saying, well, but okay, it's a new proof, but of a thing that we already have a proof. The proof of Fustenberg extended a bit the, the result of Zemered, but it's still, it was not completely new. But then in 2004, in 2004, uh, anyone that was complaining had to shut up because uh, Terence Tao and uh, Ben Green, they prove an amazing theorem. They prove that there are arbitrarily large-sided arithmetic progression that are made exclusively of primes. So this was, until 2004, an open problem. We didn't know if we could build arithmetic progressions, if you are thinking what is arithmetic progression, is the progression that you learn at school, not college, at school, the arithmetic progressions. So you are, what they prove is that you can do arithmetic progressions only made with primes number, prime numbers, and the size of the arithmetic progression is arbitrary. You can choose as big as you want. So this was proven in 2004. And using these ideas also, the proof is, is complex and have other, have other tools, but using these ideas of Furstenberg. And then now it's, it's, it's clear that uh, the efficiency of ergodic theory to prove problems, to prove uh, results in, in number theory. And uh, by the way, Terence Tau got the fields in part of, because of this, of this result. So I think it's, uh, 
after this uh, advertisement, I think we have motivation enough to, <laughs> to start. I think we have um, a few, um, a few uh, students here willing to, to, uh, to develop the theory and maybe get the fields. Let's see. Okay, you have a chance. So let's start with a, a, a review of measure theory. Okay, our idea is to measure sets. We want to, to give me a, a set and I would like to measure some subsets of this set. Well, in general, we would like to measure all the subsets, but this doesn't give us a good idea of what is a measure. Before we define a measure, think how we would measure things. So let's start by having in mind, okay, what a measure of an interval? Uh, the measure of an interval is the size of the interval. Uh, what, what is a measure of, um, of a disk? Uh, the measure of this disk is the area of this disk. So keep these ideas in mind because this is actually what, what we want to do. Okay, to create a measure that is, it makes sense with the measure that we think immediately, we cannot always measure all the subsets. So we define good subsets. These good subsets are our algebras. An algebra, it's a family of subsets that contains the whole space and satisfy two conditions. If contains a set, a, a set, then the complement of the set is also in the algebra. I didn't write, no? it's also in the algebra. If you have two, two sets that are in the algebra, then the union is also in the algebra. Notice that uh, because the complement there, the empty set is also there because the whole, the, set, the whole set belongs to the algebra. And because we have unions and the complement, you also have intersections. So we can do finite unions and the finite intersections. Well, we add an extra condition that we actually want to do infinite uh, unions. So if you have a, 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 a countable number of, uh, of subsets in the algebra, we want that the union also is there. So this we call sigma algebra. And actually that's the ones that we are going to use to define a measure. So we are going to measure set that are in sub uh, sigma algebras. Okay. So, a measure, measurable space, and the space that we'll be able to measure, it's a pair that is a set with a sigma algebra. A very good sigma algebra, very important, is Borel sigma algebra. What's the Borel sigma algebra? First, we'll define what's a sigma algebra generated by a family. This is simply the smallest sigma algebra that contains some family. You start with a family of subsets. And you want a sigma algebra that contains this family. And then you start to do intersection, unions, but you want not to have too many subsets. So we want the smallest. So this is the sigma algebra generated by a family of subsets. If you have a topological space, if you don't know what's a topological space, you can think of a metric space, okay? So, um, What's a topological space? It's a space where you define the open sets. The tau is the family of an open sets. So one, when you know what's the open sets, you have a topological space. When you have a metric space, you, can you have a distance, so you can define balls. So you think that the balls generate all the open sets. So you can think that your topological space, it's a space instead of topological, you can think with the balls. The importance is that you, you know define, how to define the open sets. If you don't know even the metric space, you can just think of Rn, okay? And think with the intervals in R, the, the balls in R2 and in Rn and so on, okay? So uh, what's the Borel sigma algebra? The Borel sigma algebra is the sigma algebra that is generated by the topology. It means that is the smallest sigma algebra that contains all the open subsets. So, well, recall that the sigma algebra contains also the complement. So if it contains the, all the open subsets, contains also all the closed subsets. But this 
let's just focus that, okay, it contains all the open subsets. Now, finally, we can measure. So you have a measurable space. A measure is simply a function that takes values in, a, in the zero infinite uh, interval. So the measure can be zero and can be infinite and can assume any value between zero and infinite. The, it, to be a measure, it has to satisfy two conditions. The, the empty set has to, has to measure zero. What makes sense? The measure of the empty set has to be zero. And the measure of the union of uh, a uh, countable number of subsets has to be the sum of this measure if we ask that the, these sets are pairwise disjoints. So you have the, your sets, if they have intersections, so then these we should change for smaller or equal. But if they don't intersect pairwisely, then, then the measure of the whole union is the sum of the measure of each. So you measure each set and then you add all the measures. What makes sense, no? This actually is called sigma additive measure, but I'm calling measure here because that's what I, the condition that I want. All right. So the, a measure space is just a, a triple. A set, a sigma algebra, and a measure. Uh, note the following. If the measure does not assume the value infinite, let's say that the measure of the whole space is equal to a number, it's finite, then you can always assume that there is a measure that the measure of the whole space is one. Because you can do the following. Ah, for each set, you define a new measure, new. For each set, A, the measure of A will be the mu A divided by the measure of the whole set, M. Okay? Then, once you have a measure that is finite, you always have a measure, you always have another measure which the measure of the whole space is one. So most of the time we just consider these measures that, they, that give the weight for the whole space one. And this we call probability measure. So a probability measure is it's just a measure that uh, gives the, for the whole space one, okay? And if we have a finite measure, can always assume that there is a, a probability measure. So we will, we will restrict to probability measures. In, most of the cases, I mean, I'm not going to deal with infinite measures. So it's gonna, we are going to just work with probability measures. But I'll make the point when something actually doesn't work. Some results do not work for inf infinite measures. Okay, so let's think about some measures that we know. Lebesgue measure is a measure that everyone knows, even if you don't know that you know. So consider just the R. So the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure is the measure that uh, assigns to each interval just its length. Well, remember that I said that the Borel sigma algebra is the sigma algebra, that, the smallest sigma algebra that contains all open sets. This Borel sigma algebra in R is generated by the intervals. And we can prove that if you define a measure in, um, in algebra that generates the, the sigma algebra, then it's, it's the measure you can extend for the whole sigma algebra. So basically, we are just defining the Lebesgue measure in intervals, and then this is the well defined. You can extend this well for the whole sigma algebra of Borel. Okay, then just focus that the Lebesgue in one dimension is the length of the interval. In two dimension, what we have? Well, if we are in, in R2, we have the area of the set. So the area of the set we can compute is the integral, no? the, the double integral. It's, it's, missing and the, it's missing one integral here. It's the double integral of, uh, 
of this. So also it's well defined. We can extend for the RN. In RN, you can define that is there exists a unique measure that if the set it's a box, it's a product of intervals, then you can measure the set by taking the length of each interval and multiplying all of them. So if your set is a box in RN product, finite product of intervals, then you can measure these, these sets. And for this, you extend for the whole sigma algebra. Again, we just focus on this box and we measure for, for, for these mini costs and off. Okay, so Lebesgue measure is the measure that uh, make more sense a priori, no? that the measure that we are more used. But it's not always that's the best, the best measure to understand problems in dynamical systems. There are many, many times that the Lebesgue measure is not um, suitable. So we have to choose other measures. There is a measure that is very simple and is very useful, which is the direct measure. The direct measure is the following. We fix a point, choose a point in your set. And then you define the delta P, which is a, which is a measure two to the power M is the set of parts of M, the, the set of subsets of M. Then you can measure any subset of, uh, of M by, by doing the following. Well, you, you give one if the set contains the point that fix, and you give zero if the set does not contain. So this is a measure, and it's actually a probability measure, and the value is it's only one or zero. But the, the thing is this, you measure things with Lebesgue, you measure a thing with Lebesgue, you, you see the size of uh, the length of an interval, see the area of a disk, you measure thing with a direct measure, and the only thing that you see is the point P. If you have a direct on the point P, the only thing seen by this measure is the point. If, the, if you have a very big, let's think that you have a, your set M, and then you have a point P here, and then you choose this set to measure A. Uh, what's the measure? of this set with P, it's zero. So the only, the only thing that uh, this measure sees is really the point P. So we say that the support of this measure is P, but still it's a good measure, we'll see. Okay, once you can measure, we have to define integration. It's like, uh, you talk about measure, you have to talk about integration because they are, duals and they, we need to talk about integration. Okay, so first let me define what's a measurable map. A measurable map is the following. I have the map, now I, I define more generally in two different space, okay, just for this definition. So I have a map and uh, my uh, domain comes with an algebra. My uh, I don't know how to say this in English, contra-dominion, contra I, I completely forgot. The set of- I guess, uh, I guess you can say co-domain or something. Like co-domain. Yes, yeah. contra-domain. Okay, yeah. thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, I just can see. Co-domain, the co-domain has another algebra. Then you, what do you want? You want, that the pre-images of elements in the algebra in N are in the algebra of M. So you want to bring back some subsets with the map to M. You choose a subset that are in the algebra B, it's in the B algebra in N, on N. And then you bring it back with the map. And then you want that this is also a, an algebra in the algebra A. Well, you could think the following. You are studying the map. Why don't you define it the different? Why don't you say that uh, choose uh, uh, A in M and define that FA belongs 
to the algebra B. Why do we have to bring it back? Well, in general, images don't work well with sets. We have good properties for pre-images, not good properties for, for images. And also with union and uh, intersections, and also, if you think what's our favorite sigma algebra is the Borel sigma algebra. And then you can think is the open sets. And you know the following. You know that when you consider a map that's continuous, the pre-image of an open set is open. The image may not be open. In general, it's not open. So you don't know. Open sets are continue being open if you bring backwards if you do the pre-image but if you do the image forward you, you you lose it so the pre-image will work better for for what we plan to do and still we have information of the map okay so to define the integral of a map i define uh, of a function i start by defining for simple functions a simple function is is just a function that it's like a, a, a staircase, we have uh, a finite number of uh, real numbers and a finite number of sets. So you, you may think that uh, the map is like this. Well, it's a constant alpha one, then in, the, in a subset A1, and then you have another subset A2, and it's another constant uh, alpha two, and then you have another subset A3, and then the image, it's a, I forgot to put there. Okay. And then the image is the, another constant. So the graph is going to be this red thing. So it's like a, a, a stair map. So the simple function, it's basically constant in finite pieces of, uh, of uh, subsets. Okay. You, can you write this function as this sum? The characteristic function is very important. And this, it's related to the direct measure. The characteristic function, it's the function that see if, if a point belong or not to the set. So if you have a, a point, you fix the set A. So the characteristic function on A, it's simply one or zero. It's one if X belongs to A and it's zero if it doesn't. So it's see how many points are in A, okay? Uh, then we define the integral for a simple function, very, very simply. <laughs> you just put the constants that have the, in the stair, steps of the staircase times the measure of each set. So you have the measure mu, you want to, to integrate the, the, the simple function s with respect to mu. So just add, it's a finite sum, you add the constant that multiplies. Let me do again, there, your map is like this, could be also going down, no? Then here is the alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, that's how it's the value of the map and the sets, that are defined A1, A2, A3, and so on, okay? So then it's, it's very easy to define. But the good thing is that if we have a, a, a function that's non-negative, there is always a sequence increasing of measurable functions, simple, such that the limit of this sequence is exactly the map, the Pontual limit. So can always approximate a function via a sequence of simple functions. And this allows us to, to define an uh, integral via the, simp the, function, the integral of simple function. You just do the limit of integrals. Since for each map given, I have the sequence that converges to this map, then I define the integral of this map by taking the limit of the integral of the sequence. Okay, so this in the right side, the integrals are well defined because SN are all simple. And then I take the limit of the integral that's a real number. That's the limit on R. Well, I just defined for non-negative, but it's, it's not uh, hard to extend for any measurable function, simply by taking the positive part and the negative part of a function, which are both uh, positives. 
Okay. So uh, we say that uh, a function is integrable if it's measurable and the integral is finite. If the integral that we define it's a number, then the function is integrable and we denote by L1 uh, mi of mu, all the, all the integrable functions. Okay, uh, just for defining, because you are going to use this, when we have a measurable function, we define the, the, the integral over all the whole space. If we want to define in the subset, it's, it's simply up, multiplied by the characteristic function of this subset. Remember that the characteristic function gives zeros, gives zero to the complement of E. So make sense. Okay. Just to finish the review with an uh, example, uh, you can think of the following. Fix a finite number of points in your set. For each point, give me a number, a positive number. And I also want that when you add all the numbers that you gave for, this, for these points, that it, it gives me one. The, the sum, it's one. So you can think that this is a, a probability vector. Okay. How do we define a measure on the subsets of M with this hypothesis? It's simple. You define a measure of each subset by adding the, the points, the, the, the numbers PI the, in the following way. You look at the, space, the subset A, and then you check how many XI you have inside. OK, you have X1, and then you add P1. You have XJ, you add PJ. And then you add this and the sum is at most one. So it's a probability measure. You can here write this using the Dirac measures. This is actually the PI times the Dirac on the XI. Because if uh, XI is not in A, the Dirac is given zero. So it's not going to appear on this sum. Once you write like this, the integral of any, any function, it is because if the measure is this, the integral of any function is simply apply the function in these points and multiply by, by pi. This is going to appear in the, maybe in the third lecture. It's, it's appear like a simple example, but it's useful to understand the more, uh, less trivial examples, okay? So this, this finish our uh, uh, review. And uh, we should enter now in the main point of the God theory, which is studying invariant measures. So what's an invariant measure? You have a map. From now on, we are considering at least that we are in, this, in the measure space. OK, we always have a measure and uh, a sigma algebra. OK, so a measure is. It's invariant under the map if the measure of each measurable set is equal to the measure of the pre-image of the set. Remember that the pre-image of the set is measurable. I, we can measure, it's a measurable set because we define the, the measure, the, the map to be measurable if this set belongs to the sigma algebra. So I can measure what is in the right side, I can measure. Again, you would like to write mu A, it's equal to the mu of the image of A. But the image of A, I don't know if it's measure, measurable. Okay, but what does it mean? It means that, well, roughly, the probability of a point to be in a set is the same, same probability of the image of this point to be in this set. So that's what you want. We can generalize these four flows. And we say that a, a, a measure, it's invariant under a flow, if it's invariant under each map of the family of the flows. So we want the same equality, but for all t's. So the only difference is that we want this hold for all the t in R, okay? Uh, I should make a point here. Okay. Okay, so the first question is, 
Is there in general invariant measures? Because you want to use the invariant measure to understand your dynamical system. Is there, can I give me a map? Can I create an invariant measure? Well, a, a very simple but very useful example, it's with the GIRIC. Suppose you have a fixed point, it is. Fx is equal to x. If you have a fixed, ah, sorry, it's not x, né? fp. P, P is the fixed point. If you have a fixed point, then the GIRIC on this point, it's an invariant measure. You can generalize a bit if you have a periodic point. If you have a periodic point, and let's say that the first time the, 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 the smaller period that is n, it's the first time that you return is, is f n p is equal to p, and the n is the smallest number. Uh, then you can create a, a measure that's a bit uh, less trivial than the direct on p, but in the same sense, you just do a combination, uh, a linear combination of uh, direct on the op. Note the, follows, the following, uh, you have your point p, and then you have fp, and then you have uh, f2p, and you continue, and then you have fn minus 1p, and then when you have fn, you return to p. And then if you do fp, you are here, and then if you do again, so fp is equal to, this is equal to fnp, and this is equal to fn plus 1p, and so on. So the opt of a periodic point is finite, has only any points on it. So when I define this measure, what I define? I define a measure that is supported on the opt of the point P. But then I divide by N to make it a probability. Remember that I want that the measure of the whole space is to be one. So I divide by N. But this measure is nice, it's invariant, but only see the opt of this point. Well, it's a bit better than delta P because only see P, but this only see the opt of this point which is finite. Still these measures are nice. And still we, may, we are able to build some measures, but we build these measures under the hypothesis that we have periodic points. If I met, if I met do not admit a periodic point, what do we do? Well, there is a nice theorem that guarantees that in a very general setting, we have invariant measures, and then we can start to do ergodic theory. That's that what builds the ergodic theory. Otherwise, you cannot even start to do anything. So if you have a map that's only continuous on a compact metric space, then there exists at least an invariant measure, at least one. Well, if you lose compactness, you may not have, uh, have invariant measures. And if you lose continuity also, you, don't have, you may not have invariant measures. This theorem is extended for uh, exa exactly the same way. Instead of a map, you have a flow that's continuous on a compact map space. You also have an invariant measure. Uh, Recently, I'm very interested in, uh, in some flows that are not continuous. And because of this, they are not, uh, they are not, uh, they don't have immediately an invariant measure. So you have to work a bit more to get an invariant measure to start to do anything. So I, I'll just tell you briefly because I found them nice. It's called, they are called impulsive, impulsive flows. They appear in many different fields. And the idea is just the following. You start with a flow, start with a flow, and then your trajectory is continuous. Start with a flow, nice. Can be continuous, can be differentiable, can be smooth. And then you do the following. You create problems. You put a set inside of your space. Let's call this set the impulse set. And then you, do, you say, the, oh, well, you walk on your flow, once you hit the set, once your flow hits the set, the trajectory hits the set, it jumps. It jumps. Let's say that it jumps for another set ID. And it, how it jumps? Ah, it jumps using some map I, that's your impulse. Let's say that jumps here. Okay. 
you came with the flow, you start, and then, but if you started with a flow, let's say FT, for each point, it passes a trajectory. So you walk on this trajectory, it jumps using this impulse function. And then you came here, but from here, it starts a new trajectory that from, from the flow that you start with. And then you continue with this trajectory. And then until you hit again, okay, you hit again, you jump again with the impulse. And then you, it, it will be a new trajectory that was passing here, you continue until you hit again. And then you can hit infinitely many times. Well, this, it's obviously not continuous, but these models, many, many problems in biology, in physics, in, in, in economics, in, in many different uh, fields. And the, the inherent problem of this is that there is no continuous, uh, it's not continuous. It's nice, but it's not continuous. So in general, there is no invariant measure. I'm not going to do it, but this is an, an example that uh, the best general result that we can have is continuous map on a compact map space. Okay, I, I want to give some ideas. I, I don't know how much is my time. I think I started a bit late. Stefanella. Yes, you, you can always uh, 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to give some ideas of uh, the existence of invariant measures of this theorem because it's, uh, well, the construction is nice, use a bit of functional analysis. So I'm going to give just just the care of it. I'm not going to give all the details, would we'll use a lot of time to prove with all the details. But I, I want to at least give the ideas how to prove that um, in this setting that I, we have a map continuous, EM it's compact, compact map space. So in this setting, we also have an invariant measure. I will denote, I'll make a notation, M1, it's a one down here, M1 of M is the set of all the probability measures on M. I always use the, uh, these notes on black and writing white. And I've been notes that I, I just want to keep the same color as my slides, but my, my handwriting is even worse in these colors. I think next lecture I'll change. So, okay, so we denote by M1 and, and the, all the probability measures, now the measures mu that are probabilities on M. And I, I'll do the following definition. F star mu, I take a probability measure, F star mu, I, I call the image measure. Image measure. It's also called the, the pull back or push forward measure, but I always confuse if it's pull back or push forward, so it's image. Uh, we define the following in the following way. For each set, this measure, the image measure, is simply to take the measure of F minus one of A. So you fix a measure that is a probability measure on M and you define a new measure. This new measure is called F star mu. It's the image of the measure. And this new measure is defined by taking the measure of the set simply by taking the measure of the pre-image of the set, okay? So this, this gives a way of writing the definition of invariant measure. So mu is invariant if and only if uh, F star mu is equal to mu. Because to be invariant, the measure of the pre-image has to be equal to the measure of the set. So we can rewrite the definition of invariant measures by using the image measure. The image of the measure should be equal to the measure. Okay. So we do the following. We consider our space M1 M, this is the space of all the probability measures. And we put a topology on it. 
So with now you can do a, a, a break on your brain. If you didn't study functional analysis uh, of some things and just try to see the, the results, okay? But if you saw functional analysis, and especially if you are my student this semester, and if you are attending the course, you have to understand this. So we are going to endure the, this set with the weak start topology. We consider the weak start topology. It's a, let's say that it's a nice topology. It's, a, it's a, an, a special way of defining the open sets in this set of measures, which are the open sets in the set of measures. So it's weak start topology. For my students, you can think that uh, these, uh, this is a du dual of the continuous functions, okay? Okay, from M to R. Uh, and then you, you can define which are the open sets. You consider a basis of, uh, of open sets by the following. You fix a finite number because the weak start topology for who is the bit of this is an initial topology. It's a topology that keep a, a set of, you, you fix a family of, of functions and you want that these functions are continuous in this new topology. So that's the weak start topology. And it's, if you know this, it's, it's simple to understand that the basis of uh, open sets, the, uh, the base of neighborhoods are, are defined by functions. So you consider a phi as a finite number of functions, f1, phi1, phi2, phi n, n is a finite number. And you consider a epsilon, so each phi i, it's a function, so takes values on R, which is bounded. It's not linear, it's bounded and continuous. So you can define the open set using the finite number of bounded and continuous functions. And the neighborhood of a mu, so fix a mu, that's a probability measure. The neighborhood will be depending on epsilon, this is like your ball, but depending on epsilon and in a finite number of uh, functions. It's all the measures, all the other probability measures that satisfies the following. You define using the integrals. You, you take the integral of phi i, d nu, minus the integral of phi i, d mu. So these integrals has to be, the distance of these integrals has to be small, has to be smaller than epsilon. So you define that the, a measure, it's close to another if when you integrate with respect to mu and you integrate with respect to mu, a finite number of functions, these are close, the integrals are close. So you use the integrals to define this. Okay, the nice thing that we can use is the following. So you can ignore the last slide and just think about the new lemmas that I'm, I'm stating. So you consider a sequence of measures, consider a sequence of measures. What I want to do is the following. Let me give you the goal. I want to show that there exists an invariant measure. So I, I'm going to construct a sequence of measures that not necessarily are invariant, but it has an accumulation point and this accumulation point is invariant. So to, to define what's an accumulation point, I, I need to define which topology, in, the, in what's the convergence in this space. So the convergence is in the weak star topology. Okay, so when I consider a sequence uh, of uh, probabilities, it's not invariant measures, only probability measures, Then mu n converts to a mu in the weak star topology, and you use this notation with a star in the, in the, set, in the arrow, if and only if the integrals converge. The integrals converge for all functions on R uh, that are bounded and continuous. So if the neighborhood that I, I, I gave in 
in the previous slide, you can try to get the feeling of this lemma. So the, you can you can rewrite the convergence through the convergence in R. Notice that the integral is a number; it's a real number. So it's a convergence that you know by real analysis. So you you change this for integrating functions that are bounded and continuous. Okay. Uh, a second lemma. I'm doing a list of four lemmas, but it'll be very quick. A second lemma. It's very important is that. The weak star topology, that's the topology that we are using, it is metrizable. It means that uh, we start with a topology. Every metric space is a topolo topological space, but you, you don't have the opposite. You may have a, a, a topological space that doesn't have a metric, but the weak star topology is metrizable. There is a metric that uh, generates this topology. And it's important because we can define compactness via sequence. The sequential cri criterion does not work in any topological space, but we can define if it is metrizable. It means when I say that a, a set is compact, I can say that every sequence has a subsequence that converges. And that's what I'm going to use because actually we can prove, and that's the hard part, to prove that the sets, the set of all the probability measure is compact. It's compact, I mean compact in the weak star topology with respect to the weak star topology. I'll put a star because you not have space. Okay, so now I say that the, the set of probability measures, it's compact. So if I take a sequence of uh, probability measures, it has to have an accumulation point by, by the compactness. Okay, uh, sorry, need one more. Okay, just to finish, if I define F star by the, the way that I define the image function, the image uh, measure, so F star is, a, I can consider like a map. It's a map that takes a probability measure to another probability measure. Remember that we define this by doing the measure of the pre-image of uh, each set. So this function, it's continuous. It's continuous with the weak star topology. So it's continuous in the weak star topology, okay? So now we can, we can put together all this information and give an idea of the proof. So let's go to, once you have all this, we can do the proof in one line. Okay, so what's the idea of the proof? We have to construct, an invariant measure. Okay, take a point. Remember that for the direct, we, we start with a point that was fixed or periodic. Now it just take a point, your set is not empty. So take a point and uh, consider the direct on this point. What we need is only one, one probability measure. I don't need anything, don't need to be the direct. I'll take the direct because it's the probability measure that is more, most simple. So take, the direct on this point. And then we define the following. Mu P, sorry, mu N, I'll define a sequence of probability measures. I will do the image of uh, delta P, but I'll do it iterating the function. So I will iterate all the functions and then I will have, I will do it from zero to N minus one. And then I will sum all of these and divide by n to have a probability. Remember how we defined this mu p that was one over n, direct on p plus direct on fp plus up to direct on fn minus one of p. That's more or less the same thing, but I'm considering the, 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 the measures that I'm adding here 
is the, depending on the iterates of the function f. Okay. So these are, it's not hard to prove that these mu n are all probability measures. They are not necessary invariant, but they are pro all probability measures. Okay. But it's a sequence in the space of probability measures. So it has to have a subsequence that converge. So let's say that mu n k converge to mu in the weak star topology. Okay, if it converts to mu, I, I need to prove now that this is invariant. I need to prove that mu is invariant. So basically what I'm saying is the following. You can generate a lot of invariant measures only by taking the following. Take a measure, start to iterate and do the image, add it, but divide by n to, to keep it probability because if you don't divide by n, the, the measure will be more than one, the total measure, divide by n. For each probability measure that you, that you have, if you create this sequence, mu n will be different when you change the measure. And then the accumulation point of this sequence are going to be always invariant measures. So these methods generate plenty of invariant measures. Well, I need to prove that this is really invariant. It's not hard to see because F, we can prove by showing that F star mu is equal to mu. F star mu, it's F star, well, the limit, mu is the limit of a mu and k. So the limit on k of one over n k, which mu and k, sum j between zero and n minus one, n k minus one, F star j delta p. But we, we said that F star is continuous, so it can enter in the limit. So since my time is going I'm, uh, out, I'm going to finish in, in this line. Okay, so F star can enter. The only difference would be that you would start here by one and go up to any K. And then you have a bit of work to prove that this really converts to mu. But there is the idea that we have since, fun, since uh, real analysis. You can push a bit the, the sequence uh, forward and it still converts to the, same, uh, to the same point. Okay? So this is a nice way of uh, generate measures, invariant measures. And not only tells us that have, it exists an invariant measure, but also tell a, a method to create it. And... Uh, and tells us another thing that we can have, depending on the space, we can have plenty of invariant measure. We can have many measures because for each measure, probability measure that you start, you create a sequence and maybe the sequence have many accumulation points and all the accumulation points are going to be invariant measures. So one big field in God theory is to start invariant measures with certain probability or certain uh, properties. So there are people that study uh, uh, SRB measures, Sinai, well, Bowen measures. It's invariant measure that has a specific problem. I study equilibrium states, which are the invariant measures that uh, maximize the pressure. I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, it's just for giving you a, a bit of the taste of uh, where we can go from, from here. So once you have invariant measure, we are going to start to have a theory, but maybe it's like too many invariant measures. And then we want to add even other uh, uh, properties on the invariant measure to choose between these ones, which one is the one that you want to, to study. We are not going to do this. We are keeping the invariant measure, but it's just to, to give you an, an idea. So I finish uh, by here. That's I think it's it's quite enough, but uh, next class we we will talk about the recurrence, uh, the Poincaré recurrence theorem, and we are going to finally see. Okay, we have an invariant measure. What can I say about the odds? Can I tell anything about the asymptotic behavior of the odds? That is the answer to start. One of the answers is with the recurrence Poincaré recurrence theorem. So thank you. Sorry for I think I passed a bit of the time. That's great. So let's thank uh, Jacqueline. So we can open the microphone. You can 
So, are there any questions? Uh, I guess I have a small question, Jacoby. Are you going to do this same slide, actually? I mean, I mean cause, because there you're pretty much constructing in very measures, in, in very measures associated to um, each point on your base space M. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Well, um, you you don't need to be associated. To, you can have, you can. It's not it's not going to be on the really supported on the opt of the point. Mm -hmm. Well, this is going to be. Sorry, let me rephrase. This is mm -hmm. going to be for each n. This is going to be supported on the opt up to any. But mm -hmm. uh, okay. but you don't need to fix a point. You can have a measure that you start. For instance, you could start with Lebeg measure if you if you mm -hmm. are in a Euclidean space. You oh, yeah, just yeah. need the probability measure. Let's say new, and then you can change here for new. Okay, that makes sense. Because actually, like I was gonna uh, ask you whether you could sort of approximate other, I mean, less trivial measures uh, by the, this sort of new n that you consider in a some sort of can. other space. There are nice uh, studies with when you consider. For instance, if you have a chaotic system, the set of, uh, of uh, periodic points, the set of periodic points is dense. Mm -hmm. Then you can, you can approximate the measures using the, the periodic points. Remember that you create mm -hmm. these, uh, these, these points, uh, this measure that it, it was supported in a periodic point, but then mm -hmm. you can yeah, create this new N supporting mm -hmm. all the periodic points. And then you Genesis. have to do another another sum here on the periodic points, and this is going to be a good a good measure. Mm. This is a nice way of construct measure. Too. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions. So, uh, you use here the idea the accumulation point is uh, invariant. So, if I don't have the um, uh, all the condition in the theorem like compactness and continuity. But if I have one particular sequence, which is a subsequence, which is a convergent, so mm -hmm. that accumulation point is also invariant measure. Like in particulars, I have a subsequence which is convergent. Okay. So in this you, case, you this, create a, a sequence. A subsequence which is convergent. Mm -hmm. So this accumulation point is also the invariant measure for the system or not? Uh, let me think of it. Because what you need to prove is just that uh, that uh, the compactness of the, the, the it comes yeah, from you, the compactness because... of the, the set. But yes. you, I, the only thing that you need is the is the continuity yeah. of this F star. And I think this continues, it this is kept, the, the continuity still holds. So I, I, I imagine that if you have a, an accumulation point, you can still prove it. But then you may have to work a bit more in the step that I didn't do here, because we use the, um, th these neighborhoods to prove that in the end, the subsequence that we, when you, because you push your sequence, you had the meal, which is the limit of mu and k. And then okay. you, when you apply F star, you have mu and k plus one. And basically what you have to prove, is not really plus one because you start here, your sum in one and goes up to any k. What you have to prove is that this is still converts to mu, and you use that the weak star topology is Hausdorff. So then the, the limits are, if there are two limits, they have to be unique, they have to be equal. Uh, okay. For these, I think you have to work a bit more, but it is gonna still work. Yeah. Okay. And what about the density? If I have the sequence of density, because mu n is absolutely continuous with respect to delta p in particular. Yes. So yes. if I have a density uh, which is uh, convergent, and then what about its density limit point? Is also the invariant measure in sense of density. I mean, this is a measure, but if I take the dense sequence of density, which you is mean converged... that the, the limit will be the limit of the densities. Yes. The, the invariant measure limit is be, it's gonna be the limit of the densities of the sequence. Yes. Yes, yes, it's gonna be, yeah, it's true. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Other questions? I, I can actually 
stop recording soon. <laughs>